Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode 32 of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today on the show, we have the privilege of chatting with Chef Jeremiah Tower, an iconic chef who helped pioneer California cuisine, the modern restaurant movement, and who is the star of the recent documentary, The Last Magnificent. Before jumping into the show, we have a quick word from our sponsor. That's right, Chris. For those ready to turn their ambitions into reality, for more than 120 years, the name Le Cordon Bleu has been synonymous with culinary excellence. From cuisine, food design, nutrition, to wine and hospitality management, Le Cordon Bleu offers a wide range of programs for aspiring culinary professionals to become part of a great tradition of excellence with credentials that will set them apart from the competition in a demanding and changing industry. You can apply now at cordonbleu.edu. In this month, Entrepreneurial Chef has linked up with the Oneida Group. And Chris, get this, starting next week, we will launch a national contest with the grand prize being a full tabletop installation. Chris, when Oneida Group said that they would be willing to do this, I about fell out of my chair. And not only that, there's four prizes total. The entire contest, the retail value of everything combined is over $40,000. Again, when they mentioned that they would be willing to do this for the winners, I about fell out of my chair. This is massive. That's absolutely insane. I can't tell you how beneficial that would have been for me. I know when opening up the restaurant, you know, seven and a half, eight years ago, how much you're trying to save, you're trying to be efficient and effective as possible with the money you have in the bank account. Now, where do you even sign up for this? Yeah, Chris, starting next week, individuals can go to entrepreneurialchef.com forward slash Oneida, that's O-N-E-I-D-A, to get all the information about the contest, the official rules, and enter for a chance to win one of these four amazing prize packages. You know, I'll tell you, the whole reason why I started Entrepreneurial Chef was to help aspiring and active food entrepreneurs, and the fact that Oneida is taking a vested interest and willing to put forth such an incredible prize package that's going to change, fundamentally change, these individuals' lives. I absolutely love it. So, so excited, so thrilled to be able to partner with Oneida. So with that, Chris, I'm super excited to talk with Jeremiah Tower. I'm very much a fan. I've watched a lot of his interviews. That documentary is just incredible. You connected with him for your book though, right? Yeah, I sure did. And and the documentary you're referring to is The Last Magnificent. If you're out there listening right now and haven't checked it out, it's it's an incredible documentary. For those that don't know, Chef Jeremiah Tower, he obtained a master's in architecture from Harvard before moving out west, where he accidentally stumbled into the role of executive chef of Chez Panisse. There, he created what became called California Cuisine. From there, he went on to open Stars, which has become the benchmark for the modern American restaurant. Then, after selling the group, he took a hiatus before coming back to the industry, where he took over as a chef of Tavern on the Green. His whole life and career is documented in the documentary The Last Magnificent which is produced by Anthony Bourdain and CNN. So Sean, why do you say we dive into our conversation with Jeremiah? Let's do it. Looking forward to it. Chef Jeremiah Tower, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going down there? It's a beautiful day here in the Yucatan in Merida. Uh, Clear skies. It's about, I guess it'll hit 90 today and the pool is waiting. (laughs) Fantastic. You'll be be there shortly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, for any of those folks that are listening that might be hiding under a rock, that might not know who you are, give us just a, a quick overview of, of your background and uh, what you're up to these days. Well, let's see. Uh, by sheer accident, I was out of work in San Francisco and slightly broke, or more than slightly. I uh, answered an ad in the San Francisco newspaper about a little bistro in Berkeley that wanted an, an, a chef, an executive chef. So I answered the uh, the ad and got the job. So my first day ever working, let alone in a restaurant, I was the executive chef of Chez Panisse. Executive sounds uh, quite glamorous. Actually, it was just a little bistro. None of us knew what we were doing, but uh, we quickly learned. Then I moved to San Francisco and opened Stars Restaurant, which is the one that's the most famous, and opened a few more in various places. My favorite was the Peak Cafe in Hong Kong. And then I sold the group 
the STARS Group to an Asian uh, investor in 1998 and took off for the beach. And that's where I am now. Love it. Now, can you talk briefly about your decision to pursue a career in the culinary industry versus some of the formal training that you received? Because I believe you had a master's or received a master's in architecture even from Harvard, correct? That's correct, yes. But I, I'm a great believer in the role of chaos in one's life and, you know, and the big decisions that affect your life. And certainly um, that a- answering that ad was sort of random, but it was because I was completely broken. I needed a job. It never occurred to me that I would, you know, be a chef or run a restaurant. Probably if I knew what it meant, I wouldn't have, I would never have gone there. But I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a quick side note, you know, for my book, Making the Cut, you know, I interviewed you and, and I also interviewed Frank Stitt. Was he there with you at the same time? Frank uh, was a little later, I think, but I'm, I've been a great friend of his for years because uh, he loves that whole thing that we were doing at Chez Panisse and he's done it with Highlands Grill. I'm a great fan of, of Frank Stitt. Well, and and let's just dive right in. You, you know, he... Uh, went to Alabama where he was from originally and, and started, you know, applying you know, Appalachians to the, the, the products, which you started out there in California. Maybe you could talk a bit about, you know, Chez Panisse and, and what you started doing there that really invented a whole new type of cuisine. Well, you know, when I say to you, I can, anyone listening, I can just see their eyes glazing over when I say something like, Every single product that was in uh, whole in, that is now in Whole Foods, except for perhaps iceberg lettuce, did not exist. I mean, I had to drive 10 miles to find olive oil. There was only one place, an Italian deli in Oakland. Um, there was nothing. I mean, fresh herbs I stole from people's gardens. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, this uh, was a tradition in San Francisco in the Bay when fishermen went out to catch salmon. Um, or the sports fisherman, the, the boat boy, on the way back, any fish he caught, he could keep. So one day, early on, um, there was a knock at the back door of the kitchen, and this guy walked in holding a huge wild king salmon. And I was just, I thought, oh, my God, finally. You know, I didn't know where to get salmon that fresh. So I said, just spread the word. You know, you bring anything from the bay or from outside the bay to me, and I will buy it from you. And then the word spread around. So suddenly there were sort of ancient hippies bringing mushrooms from the Berkeley Hills, uh, you know, people bringing mussels. And, and next thing I knew, we were raising geese in Sonoma to make cassoulet. I mean, that's how it started because there was nothing. So, I mean, you know, flowers are everywhere now. I used to, on the way to walking to Shape and East from my little apartment, there was a, a garden that had lots of nasturtiums. So I would bring a bag and pick them on my woodwork and I'd, you know, put them on salads for lunch. Everyone thought, God, that's really weird. Flowers on food. (laughs) That's how far we've come. When you were taking these ingredients and doing what you were doing, were you just kind of having fun or were you really trying to actually create this new cuisine, if you will? Well, it sounds ridiculous to say we had no idea we are creating a new cuisine. You know, I mean, I was just trying to get lunch on the table for 60 people, cooking by myself, by the way, though the dishwasher did peel potatoes. And then we did, you know, 100 dinners, and then I just had one uh, other cook helping me. So we all, we each cooked four, I mean, each cooked two dishes. Um, we didn't have time to think about that, and I was just trying to fill the restaurant. And that's when I came up with the ideas of, you know, the regional dinners in France, uh, then around the United States, and finally the California Regional Dinner in 1976, which you know grabbed the attention of all the press in order to call it California cuisine. But we, I had no idea that we were doing anything sensational. It was just the only way I knew how to cook, the only way I wanted to cook, and the only thing that turned me on. I mean, let's say that ingredients are what it's all about. I mean, if you ever lose your love of those, you should... Uh, slam the door of your kitchen and leave. That's a good, good good advice for those listening. For you, when you moved on from Chez Panisse, you, and you bounced around a little bit, then opened up Stars, was that transition really kind of almost like you had grown, outgrown Chez Panisse? 
Well, yes. I mean, Alice wanted, I mean, there were six partners. Uh, oh, excuse me. There were five partners, limited partners in Chez Panisse and five general. But the five were, uh, general partners um, all worked at the restaurant. And the head waiter, Jerry Budrick, and I wanted to open a cafe. And I said, you know, the only thing that will keep us afloat and make money and pay for the downstairs, more formal food, uh, is a cafe upstairs. And Alice and the others, except for the, my pal, Jerry, they all said, no, no, what a stupid idea. And I thought, OK, um, then I'm out of here. So I thought uh, my public was really in, in San Francisco, so that's where I headed. When you were stepping out on your own, did you have any fears, concerns, worries to contend with? Because a lot of a lot of individuals that are stepping out on their own for the first time, it can be nerve wracking. What what was this period like for you? Oh, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. I mean, you know, what, what are you going to do? I mean, you have to sort of just pull yourself together and get on with it. Um, you know, you need you need to be obsessive. You need a great work ethic. You need to be slightly crazy. Otherwise, you know, how could you be a chef? But to be a restaurant owner, you have to be slightly obsessive. I mean, you have to worry about, uh, you know, I mean, whether the light bulbs are out just as much as whether the asparagus is perfect when it goes out to the table. So, yes, terrifying. I, I was terrified the whole time. Yeah, I feel like at the same time, you know, having watched you know, The Last Magnificent, which was incredible, um, a beautiful, just a beautiful documentary, you know, they dive you know, a lot into your childhood. I feel like you were, from a young age, you know, you were able to you know, fend for yourself and at the same time, maybe think for yourself. I feel like that might have helped you to mature in the industry faster than a lot of folks might. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as a child... Um, the least terrifying thing for me was to be in a hotel telling the maitre d', you know, what kind of smoked salmon I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when it came time to actually open a restaurant and find that smoked salmon and, and, you know, find the customers who wanted it, that's a different story. I mean, I had, you know what restaurant nightmares are like. I mean, they, they go on. I, mine went on until at least five years after I sold my restaurants. You know, the nightmare that the re you, you open the restaurant and nobody shows up, all of those. Well, as a, you know, as a kid, as a customer in great hotels and on, on you know, the Cunard line liners, um, that wasn't my worry. So that was easy. But it did give me a discipline and a training to um, just get on with it, you know, pull up your socks and, and do it. I love that. And now, as you were starting to experience the success with stars, what was the gravity like dealing with this success as it was coming at such a high level, I should add? Oh, you know, I mean, uh, that's a very good question because it's easy, much, much easier getting the fame uh, than it is keeping it. So my formula was I never read and never have read a favorable review or video or anything of me, except I've watched the movie 31 times because they made <laughs> me. Um, but all the other stuff I never, never read, never looked at, just because I knew my head would explode and I'd become a, even more of an asshole than I already am, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I would take the favorable ones and post them for the staff because they loved seeing all of that. You know, at some point, Time magazine, I think in the late 80s, said that I was, had had more publicity than Meryl Streep. Not true, obviously, but their point was, how could a chef be as famous as a Hollywood megastar? So that's pretty dangerous territory to get into, it, especially if you believe it. Once you believe your press, you're done. So I would take only, I would read only the negative reviews, and then we'd have staff meetings, and we'd go through every point to, you know, improve and make sure that didn't happen again and yeah you know, i was i think too young to have dined at, at stars but from what i understand and just seeing some of the footage that was kind of the original modern restaurant is it not yes according to i mean if you you don't have to believe me but you you know certainly listen to people who talk in the film like my robert and Martha Stewart and, and, and Anthony Gourdin, who said that that was the restaurant that, you know, changed the, the way restaurants are forever. Um, Johnny Apple, who was the 
food columnist in the New York Times, said it was the most democratic restaurant in America. Um, that, that, you know, meaning that you could have a hamburger and a glass of Chateau Lafitte sitting at a bar, or you could, you know, come in and uh, spend hundreds of dollars all dressed up. I mean, my favorite story is the, the night of the opening of the opera, and a homeless, naked streaker came through. <laughs> and, I mean, there was Danielle Steele in her, you know, $250,000 dress and jewels, and, you know, and plus all the people who came to watch all of that. This naked streaker came through, and I thought, what a disaster, you know, it's going to really upset the evening. So I stopped him. And I turned to the bartender and said, get this man a glass of champagne, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the guy took one look at me, one, glass, one look at the glass of champagne and fled. Well, the, you know, the, everybody in the restaurant thought I'd staged it. So they all stood up and started clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the role of chaos and random acts. Well and, well, and I think, too, it sounds like you did such a great job of making people feel like they were important there. Yes. I mean, I was talking about Danielle Steele. That one night she was in in the usual Dior and jewels and everything. And the waiter, I could tell by the waiter's eyes, he thought, oh, boy, here's my rent money for the tip for the rent money for the next month. And I went up to him and said, excuse me, she's going to have a green salad and a glass of water because she doesn't want red wine near that dress. But look at the couple, the two couples behind her, because I had seated there two underage couples who were, you know, out on some big celebration. And so I poured them champagne because I didn't want them to get arrested. And I said, there's your tip. And of course, they were so happy that, you know, they'd saved all this money for all this time so they could come to start and they gave him a huge tip. Uh, and that was his rent money. So that's what I mean about Everybody was welcome. Very cool. Love that. And, and and not to get a little dark, but you know, life has a certain yin and yang about it, right? There's always ups, there's always down. You talked about some of those nice points, you know, funny points, success points. But can you talk a little bit about was there a, a dark period when you went through at Stars uh, as as the owner, and you, what this period was like, and how you eventually kind of pulled yourself through this period? Yes, I mean, what would the light be without the dark? We wouldn't even know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, after the earthquake, when you saw you, when you saw in the movie, you saw this sort of impact that, that the earthquake in 1989 had on the restaurant. But the impact came a couple of years later. I mean, they did abandon the civic center, so the opera, the symphony, the ballet, the government, the law offices, the courts, everything closed. So, as my uh, chef said, you know, we went from 350 lunches to zero overnight. Well, you know, that cost me about seven or eight million dollars, but I wanted to keep stars open. But, you know, finally we couldn't pay our bills and it just got really hairy. I mean, it was horrible to walk into that restaurant with the staff thinking, my God, are we going to close tomorrow? Are we going to close next week? But, you know, again, when the, when the going gets tough, you know, you... <laughs> You just do it. Well, of course, so what I did was uh, open the restaurant in Hong Kong, which was incredibly profitable, and brought back, you know, half a million dollars at a time and threw it into stars so I didn't have to lay anybody off. But we finally did recover in, you know, mid-90s. And I, uh, I put something out there on Facebook saying that we're going to have a chance to interview you. And a bunch of people actually said that they had worked for you. A couple people sent resumes from across the country. One gentleman who was in the industry, I guess, in the, on the wine side, said that he was a big fan of Speedo 690. Yes, yes. Is that the same, same time period? I opened that in 1990 because um, I always wanted to do a tropical. The building belonged to a friend of mine who said, you know, give you a decent rent if you do something with it. And I had just been to Hawaii and to see Roy Yamaguchi's place and uh, Alan Wong, and I fell in love with that food. So I thought, let's do, you know, it was called Speedo 690, which was a carburetor company. And I immediately thought of Speedo bathing suits and my growing up in Bondi in Australia, in Sydney, and the beaches and everything. So we did a sort of beach tropical restaurant. And then um, 
Wait a minute. No, we opened it in 1988 because the, the earthquake destroyed it. That's right. Gotcha. 1990 was the uh, peak cafe in Hong Kong. So, Jeremiah, in our previous correspondence, you uh, were quoted saying, I am a sucker for the slim chance. So far, 50% success to 49% near fatal tries. Elaborate on that for me, please. If I said 50, 49, that shows you how bad at mathematics I am. (laughs) 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 Well, you know, the the reason I said that was because everyone asked me why I did Tavern on the Green, why I left the beach in Mexico um, and all that fresh fish and margaritas and, you know, went to New York in the winter to do Tavern on the Green. And I I said, well, you know, because it was the most the biggest challenge I could possibly think of and a very slim chance. And well, I mean, the choosing stars was the location for stars was a very slim chance. Everyone said I was insane to take that location, but I knew it wasn't. The peak cafe in Hong Kong, the governor called me and said, Jeremiah, the English governor called me and said, I've got, I'm about, you know, going to be retiring for a year and my birthday is in December. I want you to do this restaurant for me. So I can have my birthday party there. <laughs> you know, I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to commute between San Francisco and Hong Kong? Yes, he said. So I did. That was a slim chance. So I, I, I believe these opportunities come by and your immediate reaction is, you know, I have to be crazy to do that. And that's when, that's when you should look again. If you're that horrified by it, uh, look again. And if you're still horrified, um, don't take it. If you're just terrified, then take it. Love that. Yeah, that's incredible. Now, you, you said something just now, and you said people said that you were crazy about, especially about the location for stars, but you knew that you weren't. Can you elaborate for a moment? What did you see there that others didn't see, whether it was the location, the concept, the idea, all of the above? Well, it wasn't the homeless peeing in the street in the alley outside, you know, and it wasn't James Beard hitting rats as he ran around with his cane when I was showing him the site. <laughs> um, that horrified everybody, but not me. I, my main reason was, from the Civic Center was, it was five minutes walk to the opera, symphony, and ballet. So my, my plan, my dream was, you know, you stop by stars and have uh, champagne and oysters or first course. And then you go to the opera. Well, I mean, the curtains were 7, 7.30. It was Wagner, it was, you know, much earlier. So we would open early. And the point of this whole story is that we would have three solid turns a night. We would fill the restaurant. All of those people going to the performances would empty out. And then, you know, the regular custom, I mean, customers that are dining between seven and 10 come in. And then after the performance, there were, you know, 150 people came back. So that, that was, you know, before and after the performances was complete gravy. And that's what happened. Was it gangbusters out of the gates or was it a, a progression? Well, the first event we held there was uh, we had not finished the restaurant at all. It was a press lunch. So I just put a huge table down the middle of the uh, main room. Well, everyone, all the workmen were still there sawing away and hammering. And I decorated the table with nails and hammers and saws and said, you know, this is it. (laughs) We had no no gas, so we cooked everything on the charcoal, which is a challenge. Um, And that was a huge hit. So the press went mad from there saying, well, if they can do that, they can do anything. Well, of course, um, the day we opened, it was for lunch because it was such a lunch business around there. And the hostess said to me, well, what kind of restaurant is it? I mean, I hadn't had time to even tell the staff. And I said, oh, uh, it's an American brasserie. So after lunch, I went up to her and I said, well, so how was it? She said, well, every time I said American brasserie, they went, oh, great, thank you. (laughs) They knew what it was. We had no clue. But it was packed after the first couple of weeks. And that's when, you know, that's when we figured out what an American brasserie is or was. Yeah, you know, as as your career evolved, just kind of changing gears for a moment, but there's a lot of, you, you said chaos, right? Chaos in the restaurant industry, chaos as a chef, or even akin to that is conflict that arises. In 
in throughout your career, what have you learned as it relates to handling either chaos or conflict now at this stage when you look back, lessons that you've drawn from that you would advise others that may be in midst of conflict or chaos? First of all, the restaurant business is like a centrifuge going the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> and you as the owner operator, it's your job to put your arms around that centrifuge and stop everything from spinning off instead of going you know, to the center. Um, so we'll get back to conflict, but chaos and random, it's like, like the streaker. It's like the lunch we did in Newport, Rhode Island at the Astor Mansion for a hundred journalists it was in 1983. And this was before starts. This was the, from the Santa Fe bar and grill. And we did a lot of, we, you know, did food on charcoal and had a menu, a California menu. When we got to the Astor Mansion in the morning, the because the big event was the dinner, which was a, a famous French chef at the time, and his crew was there, and they said, "No, get out." You know, we were just California kids to them, and so I thought, right. I mean, we have to cook lunch. We've got four hours to do it, um, and we don't have a kitchen. So I looked around, and I remembered we had the six-foot grills. We had three six-foot grills and a lot of charcoal, which had brought on the plane from California, and. I said, right, guys, I also I always travel with a case of champagne. So I you know, had a couple of glasses of champagne, thought about it and said, OK, set up the grills. We're cooking everything on the grills. And I put the grills right in front of the 100 journalists. Well, it ended us with, you know, four cooks, each with two 12 inch pans, saute pans, flipping mixed berries in the air in syrup, you know, and, and putting on a show. Well, that's accepting chaos. You embrace it. Conflict's a whole different story. I mean, that, that uh, yeah, I have no lessons for that. You just, again, face it and, and deal with it. How would you classify your, your time at Tavern on the Green? Would, would you consider that more of a, a conflict? Oh, God. I mean, that would, yes. Okay, there you go. There's a lesson in conflict. The owners, <laughs> are, the owners are absolute inept idiots. I, I remember you in, in, the, in the documentary the last magnificent you know, talking about, I can't remember exactly the, uh, what it was, but you're supposed to give the, the ordering or the inventory over to some, somebody, but they thought lamb was beef or I can't remember what, what the hell it was, but it's something not right. That was the food expert part of the uh, partnership of the two owners who asked me one, he said, well, we had, a, we had a, a lukewarm review in the New York times. Actually, maybe it was a terrible review. And so they came to me afterwards and said, well, you know, we're going to take over the food uh, to make sure it's perfect. Quote, unquote, it make sure the food is perfect is what he said. Well, two days before, that same man had asked me, it was true that lamb had both white and dark meat. <laughs> I said, only if it has feathers. And it, <laughs> it took a day or two for them to understand what I said, and they got pissed. Imagine, imagine the chef asking you, lamb has both white and dark meat. I mean, it's not a duck. <laughs> But, but, you know, and to, to your credit and what I heard, you know, from the, the, the documentary, but also through, you know, folks on Facebook and through our interactions, it's that, you know, you, you're like most chefs, very particular and you want to obviously make sure that everything goes out perfect and you might be hard on people in, in that moment, but everybody knows that you care about them and that you want the best for them and that you mean well. Well, yes. I mean, I would like to think that's true about me. That's, I certainly think it's true. And, you know, I mean, in the film, there's that email from one of my sous chefs at Tavern on the Green who lays it out. And, and that's pretty much exactly what he says. And that was nice. There's the incident in the film of the Chinese cook who burned something. And I said, you know, what are you doing? You know? And then it turned out that the chef de cuisine, who was my second, had put him on a station and told him absolutely nothing about the, uh, the dish. And in the film, it shows me castigating for burning it. And then I, you know, what it doesn't show me, I take him over to his station. I spent the whole night with him teaching him how to cook that, those two dishes he was responsible for. And he's very sweet. At the end of the night, he said, well, chef, you know, I can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> that was a first. That's very cool. I love that. Now, from a leadership standpoint, what were maybe some of the lessons or how you evolved starting out 
early in your career, you know, as an executive chef at Chez Panisse and then through Stars. What was some of the evolution as you, as a leader to some of these younger cooks? Well, I, I think it's um, way more of a challenge in the United States right now to be a leader because an example I'll give you is that, uh, so there was just a couple of years, at Tavern on the Green, one of the cooks was, he was plating up fettuccine and it was just within seconds of being ready to put on the plate and his phone rang and he pulled his phone phone out and answered it and started talking on the phone. And I went over to him and I said, what do you think you're doing? Put that phone away and, you know, do the fettuccine again. I'll do it with you. And he looked at me as if I was from another planet. And I just thought, oh, my God, you know, how do you deal with this? So the biggest challenge now for any owner or general manager or managers, chefs and sous chefs, is to have the team have all the same work ethic and expectations and passion. You can't have people answering their phone in the middle of, you know, minutes, minutes, seconds before they're supposed to play the dish and send it out to somebody who's paying for it, who then doesn't understand a word of what you're saying when you're saying that is not right. So the challenge now is to have the team, to train the team and inspire them all to have the same you know, passion and and uh, work ethic. That's the challenge now. And I'm trying to think, how how would you, if you were to go in somewhere new right now, how, how would you try to instill that to kind of just dive a little bit deeper? Well, the, you know, one of the problems is that um, one of, as you said before, the main one of the main reasons I was a success is I had all that training in the most world's most magnificent food and service as a kid. Um, you know, here in Merida, for instance, there's a couple of Chinese restaurants which, you know, are absolutely poisonous because the, the you know, local Mayan cooks, very sweet guys, have never tasted decent Chinese food in their lives. How do you expect them to cook it? No. So the point is you have to instill that uh, benchmark experience with the cooks. You cook for them. You sit them down. You bring them into the restaurant, sit them down. Give them the whole experience, the best possible experience that you could, would wish for, for a paying client um, and teach them that way. I used to take my staff from stars on trips to Paris and Asia, you know, for the weekend so they could see what, you know, French chickens really tasted like. And now I'm curious, is there something that you specifically look for in an employee when you are hiring individuals? Do you look for skill? Do you look for experience? Do you look for passion, all the above or none of the above? I mean, what do you look for? In one word, attitude. I almost don't care what they, what they say they can do, you know. Um, if they say they can do a lot and they don't have the right work ethic and attitude, uh, you can't teach them anything and it's a waste of time. But if somebody has the right attitude, then you can teach them anything. Uh, at Chez Panisse, um, let's see, I think it was Willie, my assistant, cut his finger off or something. I came out some huge disaster. And I was left there with four dishes to cook for myself in a full restaurant. So I looked at the, at the dishwasher who was 17 years old or something, and I said, get your ass over here right now. And I put a busboy in to wash the dishes. And I said, here's this dish. I can do three, but I can't do four. I'll cook it for you. And then you have to do it, make it for me right away. Come on. And the waiters are all standing there, you know, waiting for the food. And he cooked it and it was about 85%. And I was bowled over. And I said, okay, I'll do it again. Then you do it again. And he got it to 95%. Well, he never washed another dish in his life. Very cool. And, and you gave Dominique Crin her first job, right? That's right. Yes. Well, I, I did, there's a perfect example. I took one look at her. I mean, I talked to her for five minutes and knew. She was, you know, 100% the right attitude. She tells that story, you know, she tells a story like, I just talked to you and you said, fine, go cook this, cook this. <laughs> and I put her on a station. Yeah, and that's what she told me. And I feel like you you all have, you know, similar upbringings too, kind of in that aristocratic, um, you know, experiencing, you know, quality gourmet food from a young age. Right. Now, what would you say when you look at the industry today, you know, the whole evolution from where you were up until now, what's your thoughts on the direction that the restaurant industry or just the industry as a whole is going in? What's your thoughts on that? Right now in the USA? Yes. Lost its way. 
blindly grouping down the restaurant road because I can be in Sydney, London, Hong Kong, uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and the same plate is put in front of me in all of those cities. It looks the same. It's the same, you know, of the moment ingredients. Um, what happened to, and, and in its worst form, you know, have you, have you seen any of the photographs that come out of the book Who's Door? Yeah. There's a book out called Chaitan Bokus. Now, in those uh, photographs, those beautiful photographs, it's more 18th century Karim, Antonin Karim, than, you know, he ever dreamed of. I mean, I so around a plate, dot, 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 you know, 16 little different colored dots. What am I supposed to do with those? Put my fork in each one? And if so, in what order? You know? Mm-hmm. And what's that sort of splooge across the plate of carrot puree that looks like somebody took a cat's ass and wiped it across the plate? <laughs> I mean, what is all that? And okay, okay, so let's say we want that. Why is everybody doing it? Everybody. Mm-hmm. If you have, you know, tweezers, tweezer cuisine, I mean, give me a break. When you watch that on video, it's like, well, isn't that food getting awfully cold? Isn't that food, I mean, it's undressed. Do I really want raw sprouts on my on top of my fish no i don't i don't they're cooking in their heads with their in, intellectually in their heads and not cooking with their mouths and all their senses so once again it comes back to ingredients you know you should stand in front of the ingredients get absolutely blown away by whatever they are and then cook them according to what they tell you not what you are telling yourself because you want to be in a michelin guide See, one of the problems with Michelin is making everybody do the same thing in order to get a star or three or two. Go to the market, the main market, and the little market, especially in Barcelona. Stand there. If your mouth doesn't water, stop cooking. If your mouth waters, you know, grab the food and, uh, you know, start cooking. I mean, I saw little tiny fresh fava beans that had just been peeled. I saw, um, you know little cuttlefish that were, you know, the size of your thumbnail. I mean, how can you resist? But the point is, with those ingredients, when they're that good, you do as little as possible. The ingredients are the star, not you as a chef. I couldn't agree more. So I say to everybody, all the young chefs, all the, all the chefs and cooks in the United States, grow some balls and do what you want to do, what makes your heart sing. Don't have in mind what's going to make you a Michelin star. Once you become fantastic, then you'll get your stars. And so many people, you know, reach out to me saying, Hey, chef, Chris, I want to get a star. I want to get two or three, you know, what do I need to do? And I think you just answered you need to, to cook and cook good food and cook food that is representative of you. And do it all the time. Yes. The young, when I was on tour with uh, Anthony Bourdain in New York for the, for the movie, a young cook came up to him and said, Mr. Bourdain, what do I have to do to get on television? And he said, don't, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you, I think, are maybe, at least the way I, the way I look at the industry, I think you're probably the first one that, that said, I'm going to do my food my way. Leave the French nutritional food behind and kind of go my, pay my own path. Well, yes, I did. And again, there was, um, you know, that in retrospect, it looks planned, but actually um, the only perfect ingredients, I mean, the only fancy ingredients, the ones that, you know, everybody loved and thought the things that made a restaurant great, like foie gras, well, they were only in tins, you know, olive oil was just crap olive oil, uh, no fresh herbs, nothing. So, the famous French restaurants or the famous restaurants in San Francisco, Ernie's and those places with French style menus. I mean, the veal was frozen, the lamb was frozen, everything was frozen or canned. And I, you know, first of all, we couldn't afford to buy those. Um, So I looked around and bought stuff in Chinatown and from people knocking on the back door. So it wasn't just, you know, a vision. It was because, you know, the situation at the time demanded that. But I didn't do any other way. I'm not going to eat. I think I tasted canned foie gras once when I was a student. But, yeah, damn, I'm not going to eat that. Mm-hmm. 
question for one more about the the younger generation if you will or those that are striving for excellence because you talked a little bit about them maybe wanting to stand out and and how they should cook from the heart but going a little bit further maybe from a success principle standpoint what would be some of your advice for them to be able to achieve that career success especially long term well it is a bit ironic that you know it was the first really superstar chef in the united states to talk like this but uh, that was then um and i got there by not by knowing that it even existed you know it was just something that we did um but we did it by making fabulous food in fabulous restaurants so i if i were a young cook now who wanted to become uh you know had my eyes on my first bmw and a sous chef position i would uh, go and cook uh with the people i most admired um who would teach me the, what they know make it my own and then make my own thing and make it so fabulous that uh everybody would want to know who you are and see what you're doing mm-hmm. Does that make any sense absolutely yeah. and uh, i i i think too you know a lot of young chefs you know, get out of culinary school and think they're they're ready to run their own kitchens. Oh, God. What, what are your thoughts on just that whole dynamic? Well, one of the best cooks I've ever met in my life was my, my aunt, married to the Russian space scientist, who taught me so much uh, about food and how to cook. And she went to Cordon Bleu in London. I've heard that, you know, I, I'm not so sure about cooking schools so much anymore, but... I think there's, you know, there's nothing quite like visiting, the, you know, going to work for the people you most admire. I mean, there are enough Italian and Chinese and Asian and French famous chefs coming to the United States on tour. Push your way in. Convince them that they need you. <laughs> I mean, I went to James Beard and I said, you know, we need to know each other. You need to know me. I need to know you. And you need to write about me. I did that with Richard Olney, you know, mm-hmm. I went to the south of France and knocked on his door and said, you know, we can do great things together. I had no clue what I was talking about, but I was, you know, again, uh, you see an opportunity, you grab it and make the most of it. And I think that's a common theme for a lot of the, uh, you, you, Dominique, you know, Frank Stitt, uh, going out there and uh, pushing your way in and, and making yourself valuable. You find yes. Even the uh, the dishwasher that you said you know that didn't know how to cook, you'll, you'll teach him. The next thing you know, he's he's uh, a line cook for the rest of his career. Yeah, the one word indispensable. Make Love yourself it. indispensable. Well, chef, thank you so much for for joining us. I have just one final question. You know, I uh, again, thank you so much. For anyone, out, for anyone out there listening, if you haven't seen The Last Magnificent, it's a beautiful film. And uh, it does a great job of you know, shedding a light on, on your career and really just the uh, beautiful personality and, and depth of, of character that you have. I'm curious to know what, as you, you know, look back over your career and, and what you might see or hope that your legacy would be as, as you kind of leave this world someday in the, in the distant future. My, you know, I've never really thought about that. Um, but when people asked me that when I was touring for the film, I said, well, you know, this film. Um, and they said, well, what about the film? I said, well, maybe the moment when I say to the, when I'm talking about the cocktail napkins, I think that's my legacy. <laughs> 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 do you remember that moment? I, I do. Where, I, yeah. Where are the cocktail napkins? Oh, well, we have to have a meeting. And then in four days, we'll put out a memo. And then we'll do blah, blah. I said, what? We have them in storage, right? Yes. Well, get me those cocktail napkins. Mm -hmm. And it's not just cocktail napkins. It's like, you know, don't tell me no. Always tell me yes, young chef, and then figure out what you meant by yes. I love that there. I love that there. It's a... it's a, it's a true, even, you know, I draw parallels from even a business or entrepreneurial standpoint. If you are trying to pitch somebody an idea or they're asking you about something, just say yes and figure it out. Just say yes and figure it out. That's, that's what I gather from that. I love that, Chef. That's what hospitality is. That's what the industry should be. Don't tell me as a customer, I'm sidling up to a bar, I'm dying for, you know, 
a perfectly made, very cold Manhattan straight up. And then all you can do is tell me what, how it cannot happen. I mean, I just get up and leave. That's not hospitality. You, you, you say yes. Even if you don't know how to make a Manhattan, you say yes. You gulp. <laughs> <laughs> You walk away, you look at your little book or notes under the counter, and then you make the drink. Mm -hmm. Or find your phone, right? <laughs> find your phone. <laughs> Just not in front of chef. <laughs> and that's right. <laughs> not in front of the customer. <laughs> or if you're real, really, really good at it and a real smart aleck, you can just pull out the phone and say, I've got several Manhattans here. Which of the recipes would you like? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that just goes back to, you know, the reason why we're hopefully in this industry is, is to, to serve people and, and, and to do it, you know, hopefully in a way where they feel appreciated and respected, but maybe in our kind of own flair, which I think you've done such a great job of doing. Yes. And thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Chef. We'll uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. A pleasure. Let's talk again. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Sean, that was our conversation with the one and only Chef Jeremiah Tower. That was a blast. Awesome man. It was a lot of fun. W what were your takeaways? Yeah, there was a lot there. He, he told some really neat stories, and in those stories were a lot of lessons that were embedded. I really enjoyed one of the last points that he made. I profoundly enjoyed it, I should say, in his essence of hospitality. Essentially, just say yes and figure it out. And that can be applicable to so many things in life. Instead of arguing about what you can't do and giving in to potentially limiting beliefs that you may have, just say yes. Say yes and figure it out. Commit to something and figure it out. I absolutely love that. And again, it's just so applicable, whether you're in the restaurant industry, any industry, whether you're starting out mature in your career it does not matter just say yes and you can figure things out i absolutely love that what about you chris love it sean you know i think for me what really resonated well honestly the whole conversation but in particular was you know talking about the chaos and how you know restaurants the food industry as a whole life as a whole really is all about you know things happening unexpectedly and being able to adjust you know, you told the story about you know, being up in Rhode Island and having that lunch and you know, finding a way to kind of make it work. And as a result, I mean, that's where the word California cuisine was first actually coined. Uh, and it was a complete mistake. Uh, and, and so I think I think he's done a great job of of taking, you know, things that might be what you call serendipitous, things that are you know, delightful accidents and, and finding ways to kind of spin those in a positive way and, and actually make something, you know, better than you ever thought imaginable could, uh, could have come from it. So, you know, that, uh, I think really just speaks to me and, uh, and honestly, a lot of, I think what a lot of our lives kind of consist of as a whole. So that was a lot of fun, Sean. Y'all let us know what you think, share this one out to your friends and, and uh, on social media. So with that, we'll leave you the final quote from chef Jeremiah himself. I am a sucker for the slim chance. So far, 50% success to 49% near fatal tries. Once something is done, I pay no attention to it, but I always look to the next thing down the road. And with that, we're signing off. 